someone, this is your time to, all right. Uh, and we are also gonna turn on live transcripts. So for those who, um, this would be helpful for them to follow along, then that is what we're gonna do. All right, so uh, to get started, uh, our guest speaker today is Sarah E. Johnson. Uh, Sarah spent a year exploring wondrous New Zealand. Everywhere she snooped, there was a mystery that needed writing. As a result, her first book, Molten Mud Murder, was published September 2019 by Poisoned Pen Press Sourcebooks. It is the first in the Alexa Glock forensic mysteries set in New Zealand. The second book, The Bones Remember, came out September 2020. I am currently reading it and it's amazing. Number three, The Bone Track is due out February 2022 and she has gotten a contract for three more books. So just to let you in on this, next year we're gonna definitely do a panel where people talk about their journey to getting printed, <laughs> to her getting her book deal, to actually getting an Ellery Queen, we're going to take the table through that journey. So that's so amazing. So congratulations, Sarah, um, on your, your um, contract extension. Sarah lives in Durham, North Carolina. She is a part-time educator and full-time snooper. She is a graduate of Durham Citizen Police Academy, president of Triangle Sisters in Crime, and a member of the North Carolina Writers Network. So I am more than thrilled and pleased to introduce to you, Sarah. Take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Pamela. Pamela is so amazing. We are just so lucky to have Pamela um, on our board and for everything she's done. Uh, by the way, these people that are in the critique group, they had critique this morning and they've had like a 10-minute a break between now and um, being here. So, so thank you. All right. So I, I hope this is going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started with um, my presentation. And for some reason, it always starts two uh, slides in. So anyway, this is my first slide and this is what I hope to cover today. Some of you are new and some of you are not members of Triangle Sisters in Crime, and we are so glad you're here. Our members, of our, our meetings are always open to the public, and we're so glad you're here. But just a little bit about Triangle Sisters in Crime. It's an organization that was started in 1987 by 27 women because women were not getting uh, the same number of reviews as men and we're not getting uh, this, um, advances as high as men. So some of these kick-ass women started this organization. And of course we include men, we include everyone in our meetings, but that's uh, why Sisters in Crime was started. Two of the starters are favorite mystery authors of mine. Uh, Sarah Peretsky and our own Margaret Marin uh, were two of the people that started Sisters in Crime. Now there are 59, Gina, correct me if I'm wrong, there are 59 chapters uh, that cross 12 time zones. So we're really big and there's just about to be the first chapter in Great Britain. So it's really cool. So anyway, we're going to talk about uh, the elements of mystery, history of mystery, golden age of mystery, and then I hope to open this up for discussion. Why do you guys think mystery is so darn popular? It continues to be popular. So I know the first part of this, the elements of mystery, um, it's like preaching to the choir. I would never use a cliche like that in my writing, but in my talk, I'm going to use a cliche. But go ahead in the chat if you would. Um, add one or two things you think every mystery needs. What are some of the important elements of a mystery? What are your expectations when you open up a mystery book? And maybe uh, Pamela, will you be able to read those when they come in? We'll see how many are on my list. Uh, victim, puzzle, suspense, sleuth, good characters, plot twist. Uh, unreliable characters, lovable characters, uh, solving a puzzle, inciting incident. <laughs> you got them all. Let's take my list. All right, here's my list. Did anybody say a strong hook, Pamela? <laughs> um, well, no, not in those words, but I think, uh, no, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think, and I, you guys all probably agree with me, that an essential feature of a mystery is a strong hook. When we had uh, Hank Philippi Ryan at our workshop, she called the first uh, sentence even a blink reflex. You know, just by reading the first sentence, whether you want to continue reading that book. And I, and I love that term, blink reflex. So a great mystery should invite the reader in. Um, a great opening is critical. It should build intrigue from the very first line. And I think, and not all mysteries have this, but this is, this is my list, by the way. I think an atmospheric setting is really important for a mystery. Uh, it can create an intense reading experience. And some of my favorite authors that I think nail the atmospheric setting are Dana Stabenow, who writes, who sets her mysteries in Alaska. Jane Harper, who sets her mysteries, well, she is Australian and her mysteries take place in Australia. Uh, um, let's see, Donna Leone, Venice, Louise Penny. So many people are big Louise Penny fans. And of course, hers are in Three Pines. And uh, Sarah Johnson, that's me. My mysteries take place in New Zealand. And I really enjoy exploring the Maori culture, uh, the Kiwi culture, the fauna uh, in New Zealand, the flora and fauna. Um, so I think New Zealand makes a really good atmospheric setting. And of course, let's see, let's get on. Of course, there has to be a crime. There has to be a sleuth. I'm sure those were uh, on the list in the chat. What I would like to know in the chat right now, um, if you're reading a mystery or if you are writing a mystery, what is the profession of your sleuth? While we're waiting for um, Pamela to read the chat that, that comes in, uh, the profession of my, my book, uh, Alexa Glock is a forensic odontologist. So she sometimes solves crime by measuring bite marks. What are some other so, professions, Pamela? Writer, we've got writer, detective, um, former newspaper reporter, now PI, um, food writer. Oh yeah, Ashley's um, character is a food writer, TV personality, retired female reporter, bartender to Treasury Department to, sec to Secret Service. Wow. Um, are different. Well, I, I think that they're in different stories. Um, a group of elderly ladies um, who come together in an elegant apartment, um, an art museum that's someone who works at an art museum, oh, a sommelier. A that's nice. Ooh, I want to read that oh. one. <laughs> I loved the research on that. So, yes. <laughs> that good writer. <laughs> oh, that's they have a lot great. of writers in the mix. Mm -hmm. That's a great. salvage specialist. Yes. Salvage that's specialist with excellent. Glasses. I love. So, a sleuth can have a variety of professions. Uh, one, another one that I don't think was me uh, mentioned in the chat. I really like the um, park ranger. Who is, who is that? The park ranger sleuth uh, is really good. Um, it'll yeah, come to me in a minute. And then Forensic archaeologist is another one. And then we have someone mentioned a funeral home cosmetologist. Oh my gosh, that's... that is great. <laughs> that's so, pretty cool. So of course, that's a really important element is, is who your sleuth is. I think a villain is really, really important too. It's been said that a suspense story is only as good as its antagonist. And James Patterson says, and by the way, 70% of the books that James Patterson sells are to women. And that really surprised me. But he says villains must be worthy opponents. The reader has to believe that the bad guy is fascinating enough, clever enough, and bad enough to defeat our hero. And I just happened to be reading a mystery right now by William Kent Kruger. And he was interviewed recently in the New York Times. And when asked who his favorite fictional villain is, he said, is there a more mysterious and nefarious villain than Moriarty? So in the chat, are there, is there a particular villain that you remember that stands out in your mind? Who are some of your favorite villains? That's a tricky one. <laughs> um. Anything coming in? 
Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> yes, that's on my list. Mm -hmm. Um, Nora, oh, Nora E's, let me see. Oh, The Villain in the Hunting Party. The book, The Hunting Party. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm partial to the, um, the, like the dark man and a man in black from the um, Stephen King, mm -hmm. um, The Stand. Mm, very good. I, I also think of Amy Dunn in Gone Girl. A good she one. Really, is she really a villain though? <laughs> that's right, Pamela. There's a lot right. of there's a lot of, of um, intellectual theory around her not being a villain. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Annie mm -hmm. Wilts in Misery is another good villain. Yeah. Okay. That's right. mm -hmm. <laughs> so of course, an essential mystery, maybe plot. We could argue that plot might be the most most important thing. So uh, of course, um, the Greek philosopher Aristotle's definition of plot. Listen to this a sequence of actions or events with a beginning, middle, and an end. Change and or reversals in fortune occur. And I'm like, that was written in 384 BC. And I think it still is true today. And Margaret, Margaret Atwood says, stories are patterns interrupted. So of course, something has to happen. You need an inciting incident. The pressure must increase. I'm not going to go through the parts of the plot because you all remember that from high school English. Uh, we need clues, right? Did they? I wonder if anybody had that on the chat. You need clues. And I think this is really interesting. We writers have um, a variety of clues we use. And so I'm going to share four varieties of clues that we use. These are some clue types. The sequence diversion clue, put the real clue right before the false ones, and your readers and the sleuth will focus on the last clue presented. So that's a way that writers can put in a clue type. The secret emphasis, emphasize the unimportant, but de-emphasize the important or de-emphasize the clue. Uh, I like this next one, before it counts. Early on, plant the clue before it has any context. Uh, in plain sight is another way. Create a clusters of clues and squeeze the real clue in with all the others. So basically hide it in plain sight. And this is really weird because I was writing this morning. Um, so the fifth one I have on my list here is camouflage a clue with action. Just as your sleuth glances at a scrap of paper on the floor, he's hit from behind, something like that. And I was writing on my fourth book this morning and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have just done a clue camouflage with action. So I printed it out and I'm going to read it right now and it's real short. And I will just say two things. Bruce is a detective inspector and the word senior is what um, um, officers in New Zealand call their superior. So very quickly, this is an example of camouflage with action clue. Bruce clears his throat. The company is three years old. Flint said Quinn was the money raiser and he was the product designer. Flint expects the board to vote him in as CEO. He claims the company is worth 20 million. The organi organized crime guy whistles. Bruce continues. Flint last saw Quinn on March 28th. They had a meeting about patent infringement. The receptionist barges in. Urgent phone call for you, senior. So a clue was dropped, but action happens. So anyway, we writers have a bunch of different ways that we insert clues. And I have a list of 10 ways, but I'm only sharing five of them right now. So a good novel also needs foreshadowing, or a good mystery novel also needs foreshadowing which we know is a literary device, which is an advanced hint of something that will happen later in the story. And red herrings, I wonder if anybody had that on their list. Uh, we mystery writers need to plant red herrings. So a red herring, of course, is a false clue that leads the sleuth away from the villain. The red herring distracts the reader from knowing the true culprit. And Let's look at an example of a red herring. This is from uh, the Da Vinci Code. 
So the character of Bishop Aringa Rosa in Dan Brown's novel, Da Vinci Code, serves as an example of a red herring throughout the novel. The character is presented in such a way that the readers suspect him to be the mastermind of the whole conspiracy in the church. But later it's revealed he's innocent. This example of a red herring in the novel distracts the readers from who the real bad guy is and adds mystery to the story. And Dan Brown was playing with us because the Italian surname of the bishop, Aringa Rosa, translates in English as red herring. <laughs> I had no idea when I read that book. And finally, before we get on to the history of mystery, you want your um, mystery to have a satisfying ending. Great endings need to be logical and appropriate. No stuff can come out of the blue. And I would say the best endings are unpredictable. You know, you, you, you have that moment where you say, oh my gosh, I did not see that coming. It should include the character's darkest moment. The darker the moment, the bigger the emotional payoff. And um, I'm in a mystery book group and I don't think the um, other members agree with me, but I think a good ending should uh, have no long, uh, what would I say, epilogue or wrap up afterwards. I kind of like a mystery to end uh, and then maybe there's, two or three pages afterwards, but I'm not sure a lot of people agree with me. I think some people like every little detail wrapped up, but the ending should give the reader what he or she wants, right? So the reader will come back from more. So, you know, no pressure for us writing writers, really. So let's go on, oh, oh any questions about mystery elements before we go on to the history of mystery? or any comments? Um, Sarah, mm -hmm. could you please, you were giving great examples of the uh, four varieties of clues, mm -hmm. but could you just, I have three of them. I couldn't find the fourth. Could mm -hmm. you just please say them? Yeah. The, Just and anybody list. who emails me, I can send you my list of 10 types of clues. Oh, wow. Well, that's <laughs> super. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and families. include a PDF. Yeah. Well, no, we can include it as a PDF. Yeah. And yeah. send it out with the um, with the newsletter. And we can we put can it online. So basically, yeah, we can put it online. Yeah. But, you can but real quickly, I had sequence, diversion, secret emphasis, before it counts, in plain sight, and camouflage with action. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we'll, we'll go on to history of mystery. So Sophocles wrote about themes such as infanticide, exile and murder, Euripides, uh, wrote about passion, betrayal, justice and vengeance. But some say that it's Poe who invented the modern mystery with his short story, Murders in the Rue Morgue, which he wrote in 1841. But Poe, as the inventor of the detective story, has, has certainly been debated. Um, it has been almost certain that Poe was deeply versed in French literature and got the suggestion or idea of solving crimes by combining logic and imagination from reading the Greek uh, uh, fictional novel called Zadig by Voltaire. So we're gonna start there. So all of these um, detective fiction, fiction examples came before Poe. In 1747, the French writer, historian, and philosopher Voltaire wrote Zadig. Zadig, the main character, is a Babylonian philosopher. Um, and he, um, in the 1972 book Bloody Murder, from the detective story to the crime novel, the author purports Zadig is a detective in two ways. He uses deductive reasoning to solve a perplexing case, and he recognizes the faulty reasoning 
of a particular criminal in the book. And from 1747, we can walk all over to Caleb Williams by William Godwin. This is considered an early mystery novella attacking aristocratic privilege. And according to Ian Osby, the author of Bloodhounds of Heaven, Caleb Williams is the first English fiction to display a sustained interest in the theme of detection. Um, it's also, it was described, the story was described as a tale of gripping suspense and psychological power. So that was in 1794, and we can walk on over to 1819. So in 1819, E.T.A. Hoffman wrote Mademoiselle de Scoldery. Uh, E.T.A. Hoffman was born in 1776, and his book is really a German classic. And it was known, you'll, you'll hear me repeat this often, but it was known as the first detective story. And the, uh, the sleuth in this book is an elderly spinster lady, and it includes jewel theft, murder, and a serial killer. And it has been uh, um, adapted into an opera, a film, and even recently a graphic novel, which is really cool. So we'll, we'll walk on over to 1837, To the Secret Cell by William Evans Burton. Uh, and this is considered the book that started it all. And it's um, an account of a true crime story. Uh, and it's supposed to be a work of, um, of history and detective fiction in England. And you can buy a copy of it from A Books in the United Kingdom for 8,000 uh, pounds. Leslie Burton himself was born in England and moved to the US. And his book, The Secret Cell, has a missing heiress, an early police force, criminal gangs, and an intelligent police detective. And of course, we love our intelligent police detectives. And then we go on to 1840, The Haunted Homestead by Henry William Herbert. Um, and this is an occult detective short story. So all these uh, examples came prior to Poe. But let's go on to Poe. <laughs> so lots of people still insist that Edgar Allan Poe invited, not invited, invented the modern mystery with his short story, The Murders in the Rue Morgue. And I did just read this for the first time recently. It was a lot of fun. It tells about um, a grisly murder of a mother and her daughter. And as you can see, it's an example of a locked room detective story. And we have so many locked room detective stories now. Um, a couple that come into my mind are one of my favorite Agatha Christie novels, and then there were none. The Tokyo Zodiac Murders by Soji Shimada is also a locked room detective story. Uh, the Turn of the Key by Ruth Ware is a locked room detective story. Um, evidence in the uh, Murders in the Rue Morgue point to a innocent person, so there were some red herrings in there. Um, we're going to have a spoiler alert. So will you go ahead and do our poll for us, Pamela? All right, I just launched it. So um, here's your history of mystery quiz. Who is the murderer in the murders in the Rue Morgue? And close your ears if you don't want to hear, but how many of you know who, who who done it? <laughs> okay, lots of lots of answers coming in. All right, half of you have answered, so the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> Please feel free, although it looks like there's a runaway uh, option <laughs> here. So we'll just give it like just a, a couple more seconds. Okay. So please get your answers in. All 
Okay. Well, you know, we'll go ahead and close it because we do have a clear choice that the people <laughs> want. And uh, let me go ahead and end the poll and I think it will post, oh, share the results. Let's go ahead and share those. Let me know if you can see those, Sarah. I cannot see them on my screen. Oh, you, you know what? You probably can't because you're sharing. Mm -hmm. So the clear winner is an escaped orangutan with 78% of the respondents. Very good. That choice. Very good. So a lot of you um, obviously have read that. And I think that if a mystery writer had some escaped orangutan be the murderer today, we'd, we'd get the book thrown at our head. But anyway, that's that's the murderer, an orangutan. And that really uh, surprised me. Some quick po facts. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe's parents were actors. He was a strong athlete. He married his cousin Virginia when she was only 13. He struggled financially. And his death is kind of a mystery. But what isn't a mystery is that he died very young um, at age 40. So lots of people consider Edgar Allan Poe um, the father of the mystery. Uh, past Poe, we've got some interesting people. So after Poe, Charles Dickens was a leader in the development of fiction about crime and criminals um, with his Bleak House. Bleak House has a detective and um, a mystery in it. Then we go on to William Wilkie Collins, who wrote The Woman in White in 1859 and The Moonstone in 1868. Uh, the Woman in White is considered the first mystery novel. It's apparently a gripping tale. I haven't read it, but I probably need to. It's a gripping tale of murder, madness, and mistaken identity that is so beloved that it has never gone out of print. And he followed that by The Moonstone in 1868, which is considered the first detective novel and has set the standard by which other detective novels are judged. And this is, a, he must have been pretty proud of himself. And maybe I'll do something like this, but Collins had author of The Woman in White and other works of fiction engraved on his tombstone. So I thought that was pretty cool. So let's go on to talk about Meta Fuller Victor, who wrote The Dead Letter in 1866. Um, a lot of mysteries were first published um, in a series in magazines. And so The Dead Letter was published by Beatles Monthly Magazine. And it's credited with being the first detective story written by a woman. American Meta Victoria Fuller Victor, let's take a look at her. There she is. Um, she wrote more than 100 dime novels. And I wanted to know more about dime novels. So this is what I found out about dime novels. So in 1860, the publishers Aratus and Irwin Beetle released a new series of cheap paperbacks, Beetle's Dime Novels. Um, the dime novels varied in size, uh, but they were mostly about six and a half inches by four and a half inches. And they mostly had a hundred pages. They were priced, of course, at 10 cents, except I can see the one in the middle there is a quarter. Oh, hey, Sarah, this, we're, not yes. able, Sarah, we're not able to see what you're referring to. I don't think that's showing on the screen. We're just oh. still seeing the Beyond Poe. Oh, shoot, line. shoot. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, could, do you see the picture of Meta Victoria Fuller now? No. Wonder what's going on, on. Is it on a different screen? Uh, no. Uh, oh, you know, you might be sharing your slide platform, not sharing your full screen. Uh, any ideas of what I should do, Pamela, to fix it? <laughs> well, you'd have to get out of the presentation and go back in again. Um, okay. I think what we can do is we will include that as a slide <laughs> when, yeah. when we do that. Because I don't know if we necessarily need to see her per se to understand yeah. what you are delivering. Yeah, but I hate to see that um, I can't share the rest of my. Uh, so. Yeah, so you would have to stop sharing. Yeah. And then when you go to share, share your computer screen. 
Hmm, let's see, I'm gonna go over here to more. Yeah, it's funny, my new share isn't, uh, I wonder what's going on here. Okay, let me just play around with this for a minute. Sorry about this, everyone. Uh, maybe if I do escape. Yeah, just do um, stop sharing. If you can stop sharing. Yeah, the funny thing is my stop share isn't working. So huh, that's interesting. Let me. Oh, okay, there so it is. Here I am. Okay. Okay. So, so when you share again, share okay. your screen. Yeah, share your screen, not the the um, PowerPoint or the PDF. Okay. Now it says select the window or application that you want to share and everything's blank. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, is there a share bottom at the, uh, is there a share button in the bottom right hand corner? Uh, just in the middle of the bottom and that's, that's uh, just, just minimize this. Hmm. Well, I may just have to finish without the PowerPoint. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Well, um, Pamela, I can see you, but that's all I can see now. So I guess I will just have to finish without the PowerPoint. And I'm sorry about that. Um, um, could you quickly send me the PowerPoint? Because maybe I, I can share my screen. To. That's great. Hey, so, so you can continue and I'll work on getting it back up again. Okay, great. Sound? Okay. So um, if you guys will just hold on a second and I'm going to send this to Pamela forward to my BFF. <laughs> okay, great, Pamela, I just sent that to you and I'll just keep on talking. Okay, and then hopefully uh, Pam Pamela can get that up for us. So sorry about that, everyone. But the dime novels, um, to me, were fascinating. Like I said, the books were priced at about 10 cents. But what happened during this time is the literacy rate increased among young working class readers, perhaps because of the dime novels. Um, before this, regular books sold for a dollar or a dollar fifty, which was completely un unaffordable for them. So the dime novels really brought uh, books into the hands of people. This is what Rachel Rosenberg wrote um, in her article dime novels and the cheap book room. While dime novels still don't get the respect that they deserve, without them, there wouldn't be many forms of genre writing, including pulp fiction, romance, or detective and crime fiction. Their flawed, influential stories were crucial in putting books into the hands of people who would have otherwise stayed away. We shouldn't underestimate how important the dime novels are. So I, I really enjoyed learning about the dime, la, dime novels. Okay, so after the same year that um, The Dead Letter was published, Robert Louis Stevenson published his mystery, or some say psychological thriller, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And he sold more than 40,000 copies within the first six months. Um, and of course, it, that was so successful that we know the vernacular, uh, he's being a Jekyll Hyde kind of person. So after that came another person you may not have heard, but I think is has been so interesting to find out, Anna Catherine Green. She was an American. If you've ever read a detective novel or followed the sleuthing exploits of Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Perrault, Miss Marple, or even Inspector Gamache, you've been enjoying the countless authors who followed in Green's footsteps. She was born in um, 
New York City uh, in Vermont um, and earned her bachelor's degree in the 1860s. And she went on and wrote 20 novels. And a lot of her novels feature Inspector Ebenezer Grice. Um, and she also put her hometown and um, other towns in Vermont in her novels. So as Pamela may try to find my PowerPoint, I've got a joke for you. It's joke time. And you can answer in the chat. How many mystery authors does it take to change a light bulb? How many mystery authors does it take to change a light bulb? Yes, you're right. Two, one to screw it in and another to add a surprise twist at the end. Okay, so we're moving past uh, dime novels and we're moving past Anna Catherine Green and we are going on to Sherlock Holmes and the very famous author Conan Doyle. So author Conan Doyle was born in Scotland in 1859 and he died in 1930. And he came onto the he came on to the scene with a study in Scarlet in 1887. He was 27 years old, and that's the first time we were introduced to Sherlock Holmes. He was in medical school at the time he wrote a study in Scarlet, and he needed the money. And apparently he wrote the first one in three weeks. Um, so like I said, it was the first work to feature Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And he published these in uh, Beatles Christmas Annual. And Sherlock became uh, very popular very quickly. And Conan Doyle kept writing even after he became a doctor. Well, he didn't really want to. He wanted to write about history. He thought history was more important, but he liked the money and he kept writing the stories. But over time, he considered it an incredible chore to keep up with all the intricate plots that he created and all the deadlines he had to meet. And he decided to kill Sherlock Holmes and he kills him in the novel, The Final Problem. Backlash was intense. Accounts claim that people walked the streets with black armbands to mourn and protest the death of Sherlock Holmes. One story says that Doyle was attacked by a woman with an umbrella for the sin of uh, killing off Sherlock. So Doyle finally decided to give up and he gave in to his fans. And in The Adventures of the Empty House, Doyle wrote Sherlock back to life, claiming he had faked his own death to avoid his enemies, even though Doyle would have preferred that he stayed dead. So, so um, he's there? Yes. Whenever you're ready, I will. I can share my screen and I'm at your point in the great, presentation. Great, great. See if you can find um, Sherlock for us in the study in Scarlet. And I think we're at the point, right? Is that where you're at? You know, um, let's see. Yeah. Can you see? No, my okay. screen has completely disappeared. So um, I, Pamela, if I can just tell you, if could you change the screen for me? Yes. Okay, great. So um, any questions? Oh, let, let, let me finish with, um, uh, Conan Doyle, his canon consists, according to Wikipedia, of 56 short stories and four novels. So pretty good. So any, any questions, you can go to the next slide. Any questions about um, the history of mystery to this at this point? Okay, are you ready to move to the golden age? Yeah, let's go to the golden age. So 
the golden age of mystery started at the end of World War I and ended with the um, onset of World War II. And people think that the golden age stories provided a way to put danger at bay. The solving of a good mystery restores order. Detective fiction becomes a puzzle for people to solve a cerebral pastime. Most of the golden age of mystery novels were written by Brits and they provided an insight into between the war Britain. They were escapes from economic depression, darkening international tensions. Um, one of my favorite authors, P.D. James says of the golden age novel, all the mysteries will be explained, all the problems solved, and peace and order will return to the mythical village, which despite its above average homicide rate, never really loses its tranquility or its innocence. And you can see the characteristics of a golden age novel. Um, they were plot driven. The characters were not really well developed. Uh, there were limited suspects. They were puzzle driven, et cetera, et cetera. So these are characteristics of the golden age novel. Uh, go to the next slide, please, Pamela. Yeah, and the rules. Yes, the rules of the golden age novel. Now these are, these are really, if you've not been introduced to these before, they're really strange. I know the font's kind of small, but they were developed by, um, they were developed by Ronald Arbornot Knox, who was a Roman Catholic priest. Um, and he believed that the Golden Age novels ought to follow these particular rules. He believed in the concept of fair play between author and reader. Um, I'm gonna just read the first five. The first one is the criminal must be mentioned in the early part of the story but must not be anyone whose thoughts the reader has been allowed to know. And I think, you know, there's so many uh, books we read now where we do know um, the villain's thoughts uh, that we don't follow that at all anymore. All supernatural and preternatural agencies are ruled out as a matter of course. So, you know, the ghost can't have done it. Uh, no more than one secret room or passage is allowable. I mean, these are just so odd and random. No hitherto undiscovered poisons may be used, nor any appliance which will need a long scientific explanation. And then this next one, um, which, um, you know, is, is really strange um, with the no, no China man. And when I read that, I'm like, what is he talking about? That sounds racist to me. But Knox said it wasn't. And this is what he said about that rule. He advocated, in advocating banishing the China man from the true detective novel, Ronald Knox had in mind the silly and offensive and offensive racist caricatures most prominently associated with the novels of Sax Romer, creator of the fiendish mastermind, Dr. Fu Manchu, and also numerous other English and American mystery um, novels at the time. So he was really advocating against the caricature. But I will say overall, um, there is a lot of racism in the golden age novels. There are very few non-white characters. There's very few non-white authors. Interwar Britain was a time of heightened xenophobia and racism. Um, there is, um, is the next screen the Golden Age authors, Pamela? Yes. Um, one of those Golden Age authors was Dorothy Sayers and she worked really hard to critique and undermine all the racist assumptions that were going on at the time. And, and her novels uh, tend to generate sympathy for um, people of color. So that's a little bit about um, the golden age novels. These are some of the famous golden age authors. Of course, we're all so familiar with Agatha Christie, 
Nayo Marsh is a New Zealander, and I just uh, finished one of her novels uh, not too long ago. And it was so strange, the murder did not occur until like page 147. But this is what she says, oh, and she wrote from 1895 to 1982. And the book I read was one of her later ones, but it's still a classic golden age novel. And Nayo Marsh described her style, which did not change over the decades as in the line of the original detective story where a crime is solved calmly. So a, a crime is calmed, uh, solved calmly. I kind of like that. Nicholas Blake was British. He was fascinated with the human mind and his detective was uh, Nigel Strangeways. Uh, Freeman Wills Croft was Irish. His inspector was Joseph French. Josephine Tay was British. Um, she often ignored the golden age rules like Dorothy Sayers did. I read one of her books recently and there was not a murder. It was um, uh, two women, a, a young woman accused uh, two older women of holding her hostage. Uh, Dorothy Sayers, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about her in just a second, but her amateur sleuth was Lord Peter Whimsey. Uh, John Dixon Carr was an American and he wrote the Dr. Gideon Fell books. Ellery Queen was also an American and that's a pseudonym for, for two people. So these are some of the famous golden age authors. Would you go to the next screen? Is it Agatha? Yes, yes. <laughs> so we are not, I don't know what happened here. Can't see my screen. But you know, we can consider Agatha the queen of crime. She wrote 82 detective novels, an autobiography, a series of six romance novels, 19 plays, including The Mouse Trap, which is the world's longest running play in London. Um, Maybe in chat, people could type in, I'll, I'll tell a few more facts about Agatha Christie, but if you have a favorite Agatha Christie book, why don't you go ahead and uh, put that in the chat. Uh, she married Archie Christie in 1914. Her husband served in the Air Force and Agatha volunteered. This is really interesting. Agatha volunteered as a nurse and she got put in the pharmacy and she had to study and learn a lot about poisons when she was working in the pharmacy. And of course we know that she's used that knowledge in many of her books. At the time, um, substances like arsenic and strychnine, which were later classified as poisons were still in normal use. And her first novel was The Mysterious Affair of Styles. Um, according to the Guinness World Records, Agatha Christie is the best selling fiction writer of all time. Wow. Did anybody share a favorite, Pamela? In the chat? Uh, yes, we've got um, Agatha Christie, a, Mis a Mysterious Life, as a, as a bio of her, um, oh, The good. Secret of Chimneys. Um, but Jennifer Riley admits that that is a tough question to ask about what your favorite one is. <laughs> Death on the Nile is one that has uh -huh. been put in the chat by Kathy Heady. Um, and then I have a question here uh -huh. from uh, asking, didn't, did she write under another name? She did. She wrote, um, I think, especially her romance novels. She wrote under the pseudonym Mary West Maycott. Okay. So, yes, she did. Oh my gosh. And Oh yeah, there we go, Mary uh, West Maycott. And then we've got um, the author of Roger Ackroyd. That is another book. Yes. That, uh, and then there was none. I love it. Oh, was that's none. my favorite too. <laughs> yes, if you're gonna read one, Agatha Christie, that's the book to read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the next slide, Pamela, um, I did not write anything about in my notes. Would you go ahead and read those bullets? That's about, I believe about Dorothy Sayers. Let me see if I can, I gotta take that out. Sorry, there we go. Um, so Dorothy Sayers, 1893 to 1957, uh, New Yorker article labeled Sayers godmother of the feminist detective fiction. She created the characters Lord Peter Whimsey and author Harriet Vane. Lord Peter and Harriet's relationship in her book, Gaudy Night is modeled on an equitable romantic partnership. 
the really brilliant woman detective has yet to be created, Sarah said in 1929. Yes, and I think we could say the woman detective has been created, created now. Okay, so my next um, slide are African American mystery writers. And I have that up. Good. Um, so the two known earliest black detective novels are Pauline Hopkins, Hagger's Daughter, which was published serially in the Colored American Magazine, which is also on the screen. It's about a servant girl who works in consort with another black detective to help solve the mystery of Hagger's missing. Hopkins was born in Maine in 1859 and wrote four novels and numerous short stories. Her writing addressed Black history, discrimination, economic justice, and women's roles in society. John Bruce wrote The Black Sleuth. Um, it was published serially as well from 1908 to 1909 in McGirt's Magazine. Um, the Black Sleuth's detective is an African who comes to the United States and joins a multiracial, uh, sorry, a multiracial international detective agency. And both novels contain Black detectives who break the pattern of the isolated eccentric detectives such as Poe, or, or such as that Poe and Conan Doyle had established. Um, they include Black vernacular, the music of Black speech, um, uh, and they were both written basically as a critique um, of pre and post Civil War Southern society. Both Hopkins and Bruce are forerunners of Black mystery authors such as Rudolph Fisher, Chester Himes, who I'm really excited about reading and discovering more about, Walter Mosley, who's one of my favorites, Barbara Neely, and Valerie Wilson Wesley, just to name a few. All right. Um, so I think is my next slide a time machine? Yes, it is. So I thought it would be fun. So now we're jumping uh, from the past to the present. If you would just skim this list and in the chat, uh, write, uh, tell how many of those books you've read, if any. I think maybe I've, I've read three of them. How many of these books have you read? Okay, Betsy Walters has read uh, Murder in Three Acts. Oh, I'm sorry, that was um, Agatha Christie, sorry. Uh -huh. um, wrong, wrong one. Um, let's see, Deborah Taylor has read uh, Thursday Murder Club. Um, let's see. Marnie Graff has, says all, place of execution excellent as is Innocent Blood, very nice. George Kramer has read three of the books. Uh, Kate, Moyle. Kate Moyle has read six of these books. Whoa, she gets the prize. Jennifer, but Jennifer <laughs> Riley, along with me, would say the same thing. Eek, I've read none of these. <laughs> so I must get on it. I know, immediately. so many good books. And Gina, Gina Schmidt uh, has read, read six of them. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, those were like the number, um, they were very, those were very popular books for each of those decades. So I think that comes to the end of my presentation uh, is the next slide. Why are mysteries so popular? Okay, just a second. There we go. Question about the golden age is the next slide that you want. Oh, okay, there we go. Right. Why are mysteries so popular? Yeah. Got it. So I thought it would be fun to end the meeting um, by people sharing why they think mysteries are so popular. In the Western world, crime fiction, mystery, thrillers, whodunit, suspense make up anywhere between 30 and 40 percent of all fiction books sold. Um, and, you know, now we have all the great TV shows and all the great podcasts. Why do we think that mystery is so popular? And you don't have to do it in chat. You could just raise your hand and, and speak. Love to hear people's different views. It gives us a, it gives us a way to escape from the 
trauma of recent years. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Anybody else? Um, we've got here, Mary has said, good wins, evils overcome. So there's a nice affirmation there. Um, Betsy Walter says, because we want life to be guided by justice. I think that's very, mm, very well that. said. Um, Joel, Jules, Vincent Clark says, humans love puzzles. And that's another, that's another good point. <laughs> um, yeah. And then Marnie said, for the restoration of order at the end and the solving of the puzzle. So again, it's about uh, picking something apart and understanding it. Um, Carol Kimball says, because they challenge the reader and allow the escape, escapism they offer. Excellent, excellent. Anybody else have another thought about why they're so popular? Or any questions or comments? That, that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for being patient with the um, glitches with the PowerPoint. Yeah, Marilyn Dykstra um, adds suspense. You can't put it down once you start reading it. Yes, That's I the love a good book like that. Yes. Of a good book, yes. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah. Oh, Jennifer Riley also put versatile. Some people like to figure out the villain. Others never want to figure out in advance. Um, Betsy Walter says exciting. That's why we read them. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, yeah, it's all about the tension and the pacing. So yes. it ratchets it up. So definitely. And one um, thing I think somebody put in chat, but that I didn't have on my mystery elements is for me, a mystery is all about character. I really want to like my characters. So um, mm -hmm. that's important to me. But I think, uh, you know, finding ways to protect ourselves and to the search for understanding the human condition are also reasons that we read mysteries. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So you know, thank you again, Sarah, for imparting your wisdom. Um, I know that you also teach a version of this through Ollie, which is- we do. I, I, yeah, so, uh, so you guys got something that um, is taught at, um, at, at through Wake Forest Community College. Uh, this time we're um, actually doing Duke. Duke, Duke yeah, so this, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this will be, yeah, so you're getting something that um, mm -hmm. other people have to get on a wait list to hear. So um, we appreciate you, Sarah, awesome. bringing, yeah. that, um, bringing everything that you have to the table. Um, this presentation and the recording will be available later next week. I will get with our web guru, Ann Mitchell, to make sure it gets posted. If you are a member, you will get the link in the newsletter, the um, program newsletter that goes out on mid-month. So you'll actually technically get it first, get announcement of it first. But after that, um, we'll put something on our Facebook for the rest of you guys to alert you that it is available. Great. Thank you for moderating, Pamela, and manning, womaning the chat box. <laughs> no problem. Well, thank you all. Have a fantastic day. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next month. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think we've got uh, Gina, who needs to hold on. Yep. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.